Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone from wherever you are. Welcome to this SAP community call. Um, thank you for joining. Um, today we have the topic, the right approach to SAP S4HANA. And with me is Alexander Greb, who is pre-sales lead for SAP S4HANA. He's based in SAP um, Germany. And um, before we start, I just wanna um, let you know, we have Q&A available at the end of the call. So if you have questions, um, feel free to ask them um, in person. Um, but if you have questions during the chat, you can ask them in the chat, but we will all handle them after the presentation. So um, did I already say who I am? <laughs> so my name is Minina Chao. I'm in the SAP community team, but um, I'm handing over to Alex now. Alex, thank you for joining. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, well, right approach to S4HANA, today's topic, what was the motivation for this name who may sound a little bit preposterous? Um, since being part of the HANA or the S4 community in my job, um, I'm spending quite a lot of time to deconstruct the reasons why maybe one S4 initiative at one customer is sometimes maybe a little bit struggling, while at another customer it's, it's seemingly easy and um, it seems like um, everything is doing going completely well, uh, the benefits are enormous, where are the differences between those? So what I will not going to do today is telling you anything about S4. In that case, that um, we are not talking about features and functions, we are not talking about um, any architectural stuff, but we want to do the step before, like the approach, when we are thinking about um, how to tackle this topic and how to do the first step. So this is basically what the next hour is all about. And um, yeah, I hope you will find it interesting and get your points out of it. So let's start and we will start at first with a sentence, which is more or less the motivation behind all of this. Do not care for the medication as long as you have not yet discovered the disease. This is a typical phenomenon that you see also from SAP side, but also from customer side and from partner side, that we, when we talk about S4, we immediately jump on the solution. We immediately jump on the medication, on the cure, without ever being clear, what is the reason to do all of this? When deconstructing all those customer cases, I found out that this is critical, or the way you do that is critical in concerning how much your effort will be and um, how big your success in the end will be. And that's what we want to discuss today. In the first step about the disease, and then in the second way about the cure, and we want in the finish or in the end understand what is the correct mindset which will guide us ourselves successfully through this topic. So um, one thing um, that we want to start um, is something that uh, we have prepared, uh, something like a little questionnaire because um, although it's completely anonymous, we for our own um, analytics, we want a little bit to know who you are. So um, we see in the end um, who these topics are appealing to. So uh, what you will see now on your screen is uh, something like a poll where we um, ask you to answer this. This is nothing really spectacular. This is nothing um, privately or nothing um, what's um, difficult in a certain way, but just helps us in the end um, to yeah, do a little bit of statistics on um, how successful we were with bringing our points to you. Thank you very much. You can do this while I'm talking, so I will continue right now um, with our next topic, which is basically, or with the start into it, what is a disease? And since especially the European listeners, um, it's already a little bit late in the day, we want to start with a little riddle. And this riddle, in my opinion, helps quite a lot to bring you into that mindset of that topic. So what do these three words have in common? We have transportation, we have hospitality, and we have retail. Of course, all three are industries, 
all these three industries have been heavily disrupted in the past years. Transportation by Uber, hospitality by Airbnb, retail by Amazon. What do all these disruptions have in common? None of the disruptors has, in the first sense, anything which you would basically need to be successful in that industry. Uber does not have one car or did not have one car at that time. Airbnb does not own one bed or one hotel. Amazon does not have one shop at that time, but still they were able to completely disrupt these industries. And they all did it just by technology. Since we're all talking about disruption in that case, yeah, maybe you may think, ah, okay, it uh, hit them and so on. It will definitely not hit me. Okay, second riddle. Elvis, Obama, Leicester City. What about those three? Um, I'm not into betting at all, but um, London betting agencies, they have a certain rating. For, for example, if you have something like a 5,000 to 1 quote, this is a quote where you will win like 5,000 pounds if you have invested pounds into the bet. And this is a quote for something which is absolutely impossible. Yeah, for example, for the question or the question, Elvis is alive. If you bet on this in 2016, you got like a 5,000 to one quote. Um, Obama will, after he ended his presidency, um, become a polo player. This was something which also was, has a quote like 5,000 to one. Leicester City, which is a football team, will become English Premier League champion. Also 5,000 to one, impossible. Of course we know Elvis is probably not alive, at least not that I think of. Obama, no, no polo game, but Leicester City has become the Premier League champion of 2016. So we should never take for granted that something does not happen to us and we should be prepared. And this is basically what all that stuff that you hear about the intelligent enterprises all around and what we have or that mindset that we should take care of um, when approaching this topic. I really like one sentence. Um, I read it like in 2018 in the beginning of the year in the Wall Street Journal and was called embracing digitalization is a must for enterprises because science fiction is now. This sentence was quite good describing the reason why so many things are happening at the moment. So many things are very easily and very fast changing at the moment. Um, when you look, for example, at most of you probably will have something like an Apple Watch. So you are able to talk to your watch, which was just possible in the world of Knight Rider in the 1980s, where he called something like a self-driving car. Also possible now. Um, robots. Look at Boston Dynamics, what those robots are able to do. That development has happened within a few years. All of these things are putting industries under pressure, which means... Why is everything now so easily to be disrupted? Um, the clue to find the reason for this is logarithmic cost reduction, which means that if you look at the cost of, yeah, basically innovation drivers like cloud storage costs, electric vehicle battery packs, and so on, nothing really costs anymore a lot, which I will always call like the nuclear option to disrupt complete industries is now in the hands of innovative, creative people. You do not need a lot of money anymore to do that, which in the end means that our customers, and this is basically everything we are doing business with, is now in a position where he has to defend themselves. And when we look at those examples, um, you can like divide between two kinds of disruption. On the left side, this is the one that uh, the most spectacular, most famous one, like the Big Bang disruption. You can call it like print media versus advertising revenue uh, in, for example, um, digital times or blockbuster Netflix. So blockbuster was something like a billion dollar thing until the moment when Netflix appeared. So within a few years, they were out of business um, or like Kodak and digital photography. But this is not really the big thing which is really dangerous because those are spectacular cases but the more dangerous things you see on the right side with a gradual disruption it means like when for example a new technology emerge 
it's not like everything else crashes down within a short time. Um, but the growth rates go down to up to about a nil, which means that you're basically drying out. You do not have the liquidity anymore to invest in innovative technology. Um, and you can see this phenomenon quite often. Like, look at the car industry. Um, the green line could be um, electric cars, and while the blue and the orange line could be um, diesel or petrol engines. And we at SAP ourselves are also caught in that. In Q4 of 2018, for the first time since 1972, our revenue on on-premise licenses for the first time since 1972 went back and went down. But on the other hand, the cloud revenue, like from what you may see here on the green line, is soaring, it's growing. So in consequence, if we are not the best cloud company ourselves, we may be out of business in a few years. Or if a car manufacturer is not one of the best in or the best in the new economical friendly um, technologies, he also may be out of business within a few years. But how should we react to that? Basically, this is all about business strategy. Um, you see here something like a graphic. On the um, X side, you see time. On the Y side, you see the enterprise value release. And business is all about putting your enterprise value release to a higher level, which means in that case, what we are at the moment, um, you, of course, need your core business. You cannot like completely get rid of your core business and just do innovation and new business. This is not possible. It does not make sense because you need that business. You need it to fuel your innovation activities. So what you are about to do is you want to run the core business highly efficient with artificial intelligence enabled um, to feed those activities into the scale new business. And that new business, that innovative things, shall be then routed back into the core. And by this, you get something like a circle, which then is driving you and driving you and driving you upsides of this value scale. Basically, those two things. So is this possible now? No. Um, when you talk about IT executives, you're also always talking about those two kinds of problems and of those issues that keep you from excelling. On the one hand, the first problem, scattered information. Um, scattered information means that you basically do not really know where you are at right this moment. Why? Um, when we, for example, um, started with R3, which was in 1989, 1990, um, or like all the other legacy um, competitors of ours who have um, also ERPs on the same technologic level on their legacy side. Um, there was not the technology to be able to encompass in one data model all the special interests and the special demands from every line of business. So what has been done at that time was, okay, we did something like a data model, which was perfect for ERP. But for example, the supply chain side got their own specialized data model, which became the APO. And this, of course, this data model had its own data coverage. It had its own um, interface because you had to bring data from A to B and so on. And the same happened with HR, storage, with um, CRM, and so on and so on. At that time, that was absolutely not of a problem because data volume was so low um, that you really could bring all these things together again. But still, um, now these problems are getting bigger and bigger and bigger because, for example, when you really know or want to know how an order is about, you have some kind of information within a CRM system, you have some kind of information in um, your ERP, you have some kind of information within your APO, your SCM and planning um, infrastructure, but you have no possibility to really look at one place to see and to know where you are. And on the right side, the batch orientation is basically the consequence of this problem. Because as we said, when you have several instances, when you have several specialized LOB islands, 
um, you also of course have to have, like we said, core interfaces, like who translate from one data model to the other data model. And you have batch runs, which bring, of course, all the information back together again. So you are um, able again then to yeah, see where you are or to like put changes into actions. The problem though is that with the data amount that you are working today or our customers or legacy ERP customers are working today, um, this is not really an easy task anymore. I have so many customers like saying, they saying, uh, I'm a single instance user. I have basically no time in the night where everybody sleeps. Um, I cannot run my MRP in the night anymore. I have to do this on the weekend. And this is grotesque in my opinion, because those people are forced like to go on a Monday into their offices. Then they know where they are. But from then on, when they are planning, when they are changing things, when they're doing something, they do this into the fog because the results of them are not put into action because no MRP, no batch run is running. It's running on the, on the weekend. Yeah, or like um, when you are, what, what is about, for example, consolidation? Consolidation in the third month of the quarter. This is basically the activity where your job is to bring all these information back together um, on one place to be able to see where you are about. But still, um, this is a one-time activity. You know? This is nothing which happens easily. Uh? You really have to put effort into that. And by this, you're not really able to cope with those things that we have discussed already in this call. And things are not getting easier. For example, if you look into these statistics, 90% of the world's data which are existing are younger than two years. So we have a huge growth in there. End of 2020, 212 billion things are expected to be connected. Also more sources for data, data which you will want to use. So what is the medication? How to solve that? The solution for that, and that's when we talk about the cure, the medication, is a B-modal architecture of the intelligent enterprise. On the one hand, the mode one, the digital core, where everything is together, all your information, everything is on one data model, everything is on one platform. There you are able to do exactly what we discussed in um, that slide about core and innovation. There you are able to run your core business highly beneficial, highly um, automated. There you're able to transfer the core and grow the core. On the other side, the digital innovation part, the edge part, you are able to do your innovations, to try out new things, to like what the Google founder called as the crazy stuff. Yeah, like 70% core business, 25% short-time innovation and 5% the crazy stuff. That's the area where you do this. And by having this wise pivot, uh, you are taking care that none of these sides uh, is getting too strong compared to the other. And by this, you are able to move to the bigger business value release like we discussed in the beginning. So on the one side, you have the digital core, the sub S4 HANA with our cloud um, application with hybrid success factors, C4 HANA, et cetera. And on the other side, the mode two, the digital innovation part, with Sub Leonardo, our innovation suite. Good. Next part, digital core, which is the core of our medication. Um, I do not want to talk too much about that because we do not want to talk about those features and functions today. Um, but what I want to use this about is about the three principles which are um, which are enabling these benefits so when you have memorized these three principles um, you're not really in need for any cases or industry cases and so on because you are able to from this structure to deploy your own benefits because you know um, what's the foundation of it so when you're talking about S4HANA, um, you're talking 
not only about, of course, the database, we're talking about the architecture and the data models, the principle of one where everything exists just one, the single source of truth, we will talk about that. The renewed applications and the Fiori-based user experience as well as the cloud and on-premise deployed models. So what you see here in this basically full-blown um, functionality view, we want to yeah, put a little bit into its parts. So what is the first principle? It's a new data model, like we discussed in the beginning. This new data model is basically the source of everything. This data model is where we are able to realize a single source of truth, which basically means that every information just exists once. We will come to that later, what kind of huge consequences this has. For example, if you are at the moment a sub-ECC user, and now is coming a little bit a uh, weird slide, um, don't be shocked by this, it's just for like um, illustration um, issues. This is a database and table structures that you know at the moment from sub-ECC. That's basically what you have. You have like um, here, for example, in the finance area, your document tables, um, but you have quite a lot, of course, of um, totals. You have indices, you have aggregates. Why do you have all these indices and aggregates? What are they necessary for? They just exist because the technology that ECC is based on is not performant enough to give you on the fly the information you need, for example, concerning your KPIs. So it pre-aggregates. It knows that at a certain amount of time, you know, you want to know, for example, what a certain KPI, which value it has. So it prepares everything and pre-aggregates that information to be available, uh, to be able to present it to you. When you look into that KPI, it's not done in real time because the technology is not powerful enough. It's done like in advance. The problem is though, with those aggregates, um, at first an aggregate itself, it's not on time, it's not real time, it cannot be. And then of course, all the elements the aggregate consists of, there is no guarantee that all of them have the same timestamp. So um, this aggregate is not really, or the value you have in the KPI, is never really at the point. And this is the reason why you, for example, experience that in the end of your period, you're always a little bit, always different or at a different place at where you expected it to be. Because of these aggregates, because of these indices. All of this has changed with S4HANA because we do not need them anymore. We are now able to do exactly that, to aggregate your KPIs and your information in real time on the spot, on the fly, based on line items. So all these indices, all the totals, aggregates, and so on are gone by now. And basically, for example, from a logistics side, there's just this MADDOC left, which is really relevant. In the MADDOC, you have all relevant information concerning your logistic orders or your activities, which means, like, for example, imagine something, a situation which is very common. A planner, a planner gets an order and has to fulfill this order. The pl planner looks into his system and he finds out uh, he has not really that amount of stuff, of pieces and so on that he basically would need concerning this material. So what, what does he do? Reorder something like or open a new purchase requisition. In the meantime, he would have had or he has that material, but that material is still stuck in like quality management. The quality manager already has um, has like um, um, given it to the next level and has really given it free. But because we are reliant on batch jobs, this information is not yet available to that planner. So you have higher stocks, you have higher inventories because of that issue than you need. Now in this world, when you have just, for example, the MADOC and everybody or every application, every functionality, every process is looking at this MADOC and you have every information just once. The moment the quality manager sets this material free doing the goods income, the planner or the planning system 
gets noticed on it because everybody's looking on the same information. So you do not have these issues anymore. And um, this, for example, also has um, um, consequences, for example, um, on your financial side, like the Universal Journal. At the moment, you still are working with several journals, like, for example, the General Ledger, or Profitability, or Management Accounting, or Asset Accounting, the Material Ledger. And when you do your consolidation, you are hard pressed to put everything together to be able to know where you are. Now it's different. We just have the Universal Journal anymore. And um, since everything is now in this one journal and you have basically no difference and your separation between FI and CO anymore, whenever you do um, um, a close, I'm simplifying now, but I'm doing this for a purpose. Um, it's nothing very much more than a snapshot. Of course, it's has additional activities which are necessary. But from the baseline, it's nothing really more than a snapshot. So many customers are now going over to say, okay, when we can do a soft close, we can do much more often. Like we can do it weekly. At the end of each week, we can, for example, see for us where we are, what we're sending. We do not really have to wait till like the end of the quarter to achieve this. So this was the first principle, the new data model. The power of the new data model needs something, a helper, which is a new GUI, the new graphic unit interface. That what you see as a user. So when we are talking about Fiori, about your new graphical unit interface, it's not about being more beautiful. Or, yes, of course, it's also about being more beautiful than it has been in the past. Um, but it's about to bring like an entry point into that world of possibilities you get with the new data model. Like for example, in the past when you had, or when you were, for example, a planner um, and you got, for example, from the BW, your KPIs and you found out, ah, I have a problem there. Um, then you were a little bit lost, for example, to really solve that issue. Um, because from the entrance point in the system, you did not really have a guidance um, how to solve a certain problem. Now, if you look, for example, at Discord, things are completely different. You have your own personal KPIs and when you are coming in the morning into the office or wherever you are working because the new GUI is completely independent of any technical equipment. You can also run this on um, an iPhone or an iPad or whatever. Um, you see your personal KPIs, you can click onto it and by going on that, you can really jump on the reasons for this. So um, this is the first about of that of something what we will discuss um, in a few minutes, the insight to action, which is now for the first time really possible. And by the possibility to bring these two things together, like insight and action, like analysis or analytics and transactional possibilities. We are possible, for example, to do something like that. And this is something what I, for example, think is really handy and it's really describing this issue of in the core being highly efficient and highly automated, very good to the point. So for example, imagine you're a planner now and you have something which every planner has almost every day, which is a material shortage. Like you want to produce something or you want to like fulfill an order, but you're not able to because you have not the right material available. Um, this happens now with, of course, or the MRP is the, the um, run who is telling you that um, and who's giving you in the morning the bad news via the exception list. And at the moment now the planner gets all these bad news from the exception list and then he's basically left alone in solving an issue. Of course, he does this with his best of knowledge, but he basically does not really have any something like a system support to do that. Um, now, because of that, what we've already discussed, we have the issue and we have the possibility to really put everything on a new level. Like for example, the planner goes um, in uh, or starts with his work, sees still his exception list uh, with bad news, but the system now supports him in solving these issues. Like for example, if you look in the case here on the right side, um, the system identifies each case 
and says to you, okay, I have understood, we have something like a material shortage. In this example, I have three possible solutions identified for you. So this scenario means that in the background, there had been some like small isolated MRP runs, which are not really possible now for legacy systems at the moment, but who are possible in s hana system. And those have prepared those scenarios for you. And um, since everything is now together, all the logistic data and all the financial data in one place, he also can give you uh, recommendations of this is a three-star solution, like the preferable solution. Like in that case, the reschedule is, for example, faster or cheaper than the other solutions. Yeah, like for example, the procurement from another company would be more expensive. And the user now can go into each of these options, can take a look at it, what, uh, how the system would solve it, and by clicking on choose, he's able to realize that and to put this into action. And now in the background, there's an MRP running, an own MRP who puts everything into action. And by this, the problem is solved basically in real time. So this is, in my opinion, a very good example for what we are able to do. And very, although this is very simple, a very good example who shows the combination of new data model and new um, graphical unit interface, which is giving you the possibility of innovative business processes. And this is what it's all about. Um, I'm not want to talk now about basically those things that you can listen to whenever you go into something like a keynote or go to the Sapphire or to a SubNow event or whatever. Um, I want to go a little bit some steps further and I want to tell you about um, what is this new approach, what we are talking about and what distinguishes best-in-class adopters from others who have memorized what we are have talked about and um, put those things into action. And um, what you are hearing now is basically the, like, let's say the condensed um, experience that I made in the last five years of um, setting up um, S4 at customers and uh, bringing customers on the S4 track. And um, there are something what I call like top five characteristics that set best in class adopters ahead of their competition. And that makes things more easier, more better, more successful in the end. And this will be the last part now within this webinar. So number five, we were talking about core and edge. You remember that loop like we had in the end. Um, they prioritize core over edge. Um, first, let's put it a little bit again into his own path. Let's start with core. Well, the core is not really one thing, since a single thing rarely moves the needle. It's rather a combination of technologies which are working together and um, that have at their heart a platform for any mission critical processes. So, which is basically as for HANA. So we can put it really simple. It's a package that every company needs to fulfill its purpose and making a profit. On the other side, Edge is a family of powerful microservices that help you achieve a quantum leap in business outcomes. So you're gaining insight, you are able to monitor real-time events and actions and execute like special enterprise processes. Basically, this is an afterburner for your business. And this premise not only makes a prioritization at first glance quite difficult because who doesn't want an afterburner? It's cool, everybody needs an afterburner. Um, but at this point, it's quite easy to mix up the transition strategy and setting up the wrong priorities. And we see this quite sometimes. Um, the underlining premise is clear. The basic principles of success in the 21st century, and we all, we all of us have to memorize that, are digitalized end-to-end -end processes. It's basically customer centricity what I'm talking about. This is naturally a home game for the digital core, which is as for HANA. And um, if we now would put all the resources or our adopters would put all our resources on the edge side to do all that fancy afterburner stuff while um, neglecting the core process, like to attempt to, to raise as many edge advantages as possible, this would quickly come to a point where these innovation efforts are running empty. 
while. Because without a digital core at the maturity level that at least matches your efforts on the edge side, your transformation runs out of steam. We can put it on this level. The core is your door opener to the benefits of the edge. And if this door is not open enough, your effort will not work out. So when you're talking about prioritize core over the edge, it's uh, something like the game, do the one thing without neglecting the other. Be a little bit ahead with the core, then you're able to fully pull out any advantages you would get with the, uh, with the edge. Wise pivot between core and edge with the core leading. Fourth part, they divide between commodity processes and differenti differentiating processes. Well, this is about um, cutting the big cake. Quite often, people are a little bit um, reluctant to really look into the new possibilities and say, ah, this is a huge effort when we have to like redefine all our processes. Um, change management is terrible. We will try to stick with that what we have. Um, the mindset, which is really important in that aspect and help to leap you ahead is to divide between commodity processes and differentiating processes. Um, I remember when, like a few years ago, I was in the strategic council of a big German automotive OEM. And um, they were at the time struggling a little bit with their setting of how do we, how do we attack processes? How do we like put those things together? Like what do we put into the cloud? Where do we want to be on premise? Where do we want to go multi tenant and single tenant and so on and so on? And the core solution to be efficient there and to be successful is there to do this division of commodity processes and differentiating processes. This division, for example, makes even a pure green field much faster and easier than you may think. Um, because at first, when you think about commodity processes, those processes are the process where everybody basically strives to get identical results. Like where SA, we from SAP are doing no different than Airbus or Boeing or a mid-sized company. Like for example, HR. Like for example, travel bookings. Like for example, um, purchasing systems. This is something where we can say, it's much better to not reinvent this for all or that everybody is reinventing this for all. But um, to consume this as a service on a cloud-based uh, cloud um, on a cloud-based solution, like that's where you can put these processes already on the side. Done. Then you are left with the differentiating processes. And those are the processes where you distinguish yourself from your competition. Those are the processes where a consumer, for example, is made or after these wants to buy your products. They decide if the car, for example, that you are producing is really great, is really kicking. If something like a um, normal person is really not interested in. So this is something where you then look into um, how are, am I able to get all the horsepower to the ground that the system is offering me. So do the switch between commodity processes and different chain processes um, makes your entrance into the solution, your pro, your pro um, much faster and much easier. Number three, they concentrate tangible and consumable innovation. Well, this is um, a real interesting topic um, because this is about in a wider sense about um, mutual understanding of of people while having a discussion about individual innovative aspects when implementing something like S4HANA. So if you look at one side, you will find, or you imagine you're an account executive from SAP or a consultant, a pre-saler or a value engineer, or you are like an adopter internal program lead. And your aim is to convince your management of the benefits. So when you want, for example, to, to define the innovations, um, what do you do? Um, you, of course, try to get the sexy things, to get the interesting things. And on the other side, yeah, you have the adopter that 
um, consumer, that inter interested adopter, um, for example, that lob lead or the C-level person who wants to be um, who wants to be convinced. And um, in this kind of situation, you think, okay, a highly motivated evangelist meets a highly interested stakeholder to talk about a highly innovative product. What could go wrong? Well, actually a lot. Because there is a possibility that both parties will leave that meeting with a mixed feeling. And I tell you, I have experienced this a lot. Not because of the highly innovative application, but everybody did a mistake. And that happens quite often when those kinds of parties meet in a situation like that. The one side wants to impress, the other side wants to be impressed. And by this, we are all caught in the bigger, better, faster, more trap. I want to give you an example. One in my opinion, most impressive use cases that shows the power of a joint action between S4HANA and uh, the sub analytics cloud is a digital boardroom. Um, this is a dynamic real time presentation application um, with several touch screens, which is giving executives to find insights and addresses, ad hoc questions like pure insight to action. Um, that's a good chance that when you look into that, that you leave the presentation highly impressed and highly inspired. But if you put this thought a little bit further, sometimes that huge solution is not the one that you would attack when, when you say, I want to like um, realize benefits and innovations right after the go live. Just concentrating on spectacular topics can be counterproductive and imitating. Yeah, because we should always resist the urge to talk exclusively about the fun things that are thrilling and awesome, but not the first cake on the plate. I always try to put a certain emphasis on an aspect that I call consumable innovation. And those are the benefits that are the low hanging fruits on the innovation tree and who can be put into practice right at this time of go live or within the first year. And there's a lot of to crop. So, um, because in the end, it will bring much more of a short term value to an adopter to be able to do the easier to reach things first, like capacity planning, right? After the go live, for example, than to go for the big things. So what we always want to do is to slice that elephant into something like um, a short term roadmap for innovations and a mid term and um, a long term roadmap. Um, brings the maximum of benefits in um, that certain amount of time. And um, this is something which really puts apart um, the best in class adopters from the others. Number two, they lie on architectural map to maximize insight to action. <coughs> so we've talked about insight to action is in my opinion, um, one of the most important values that S4HANA can give you. So it should be in your utter interest to put this to a maximum. And um, why is this so important? I remember when I was at the beginning of my career, I was a consultant in a like, supply chain consultancy company. And what we did a lot of that time is that we were doing lots of Excel crunching, for example, like to answer the question of the customer, where should I position buffers within my SCM? What kind of um, levels concerning my inventory should I have? And so we did a lot of calculation. We looked at the demand. We looked at the, um, at the purchasing situation. And uh, we've put by this clear... Um, results on where we should put which inventory. Was this bad what we did there? It was not wrong, but it was not right also. Because what we did was like something like a one-time snapshot. And this was then the basis for something like a midterm action initiative. And this cannot be right because, of course, this Excel is true and is real, but just for the moment, where I had calculated it. Already a day after this, the situation could have, could have looked completely different. So 
you see the problem if you have insight but that insight is on the one hand not revolving not every day renewed automatically and it's not put into action like um put by intelligent technologies into consequences and into results this insight is basically not really worth a thing because whenever you're forced to leave your analytical basis you lose your context and your orientation and furthermore any automata automation or decision support or ai or all the stuff that we are talking about is unable to give you a hand since you have a media break between those two disciplines and your transaction support is not able to connect so insight without action is no real help or to be more precise insight always have to have consequences in your routine operations that are guided and managed automatically by your enterprise management system because only that then guarantees in the end that you not only get aware of critical situations but you are able to counteract in the best effective way or in the least critical situation of course are able to fulfill your goals and kpis with a maximum of precision and of course efficiency so you can for example look again at the mrp cockpit as an example of what i'm talking about so to put that together again you always have a clear to have a clear focus at the beginning to maximize insight to action because this is all what an intelligent enterprise is all about basically and the last but not least one look forward don't look back emphasis strategy part since this is all about business and not it and um this is a little bit um the times when steve jobs or other inspiring and visionary leaders turned around the fate of their companies by saying like we bring first our old stuff onto the new platform and then well of course they did not uh, sorry about to mock these approaches, but in the book of least and beneficial approaches to a new technology, these approaches actually best in class companies don't look back. They are not looking all the time just about the deltas. They want to get the horsepower to the street. And I often, often hear the statement, my processes are a direct result of the industry requirements of the area in which I do business. I guess everybody hears this sentence. In my opinion and in my experience, in reality, if you look closer, way back to the moment those processes were defined, you find out that this statement very often a self-delusion because not the industry requirements are the true reason why a process is defined the way it is, but limitations of the legacy ERP. So, sticking onto that and say we will try to put at first our old stuff into the new um into the new platform and new technology um it's like trying with a handbrake that's why i always say we really should do something different we should do a forward-looking discussion decision uh, discussion we should ask the question what is the strategy like? Where do we want to be as an adopter in three to five years? What are our customers doing? What are our, um, our competitors doing? Where do we want to be? How will my business model change, for example? And by looking at that, we are then tailoring the system that we achieve this at best. For example, I had, and this is um, always quoted as one of the best examples, I had, for example, around one and a half years ago, this discussion with a German customer of mine who is uh, into frozen goods. And he's saying, my, so like he, he also started the discussion by saying, I have to talk to you basically because in like 2025, 20, you're switching the lights off with ECC. But I try, yeah, I do not want to talk about this. I want to talk about different things, about your strategy, where you want to be. And he said, yeah, as a maker of frozen goods, my core business, of course, is like frozen vegetables and so on, or fish or something like that. But these are just low margin products. I do not really get the big buck out of that. What I want to like put more emphasis on is the convenience food market and like frozen meals. And he was, of course, fully aware of that all these meals are compromises yeah, because they basically have at least a little bit to taste anybody. 
Yeah, the one person does not want too much spices, another person uh, cannot have enough spices at all. So he's in a situation where, where he said everything has to be a compromise and this is the central problem of my products and all the products that we have in this industry. It compromises. So what he wants to do or he dreams is about to market to one where a customer is able to make his own meal, personal meal by a configurator. And then this is prepared in the factory and delivered to him or frozen and delivered to him. And by, by like including social media data, he's then able to, for example, propose, if you like that, I can propose you a meal for the whole week. Every day is something completely different. This was his dream. And then we were talking about how that is, how we can make that possible. This was not possible with his legacy ERP, but this was possible with his new, with the new S4HANA technology. So when he would go live, he will completely put the horsepower on the ground by being able to realize his strategy. And this because we did not talk about deltas and looking back and what are your processes now in ECC. And then we are talking about what, how we can transfer them and or what, what are the differences. But we say, let the stuff behind. Brownfield is not called a brownfield without reason. Let look at what you can get out of this for yourself. And by not doing lo a lot of fuss, and since we are talking about business and not IT, because IT is, they're not really um, the central address anymore, but as far as a business pro a project, we basically together um, managed to make a best in class adopter. So when you all put this together, in other words, from this mindset and from the real right approach to S4HANA, we should not attempt to approach S4HANA the way we approach ECC because it's a whole different game. And I hope that today um, in this quite limited, um, quite limited time amount of an hour what we had now, I was um, able to give you an insight and uh, give you an idea of what this is all about. And before we come to the Q&A session, I want to do um, or to get your attention to two things which are quite important to me in the end. The one thing is um, that if you are interested in or if you like what we are talking about or think these ideas are interesting, I have a blog which you can look into it either on the sub-community website or on LinkedIn, which is yeah as called as this... Um, webinar the right approach to s4hana like connect with me on linkedin and um, we can together take a look into it and starting from i hope in july um, i will be hosting the sub experts podcast um, where we basically in every episode will take a look into topics which are relevant and I subtitled it people, tech, and strategy because it's all about that. It's not only about technical stuff, but it's all about people within the technical stuff. And um, we also will have Q&A episodes. So um, what I can invite you, uh, not only, of course, to, to subscribe it, but um, when you have certain questions, like, for example, after this webinar, contact me on LinkedIn, send me a message with your question. We will have, as I said, Q&A episodes um, with our guests. So um, we will definitely try to answer it there. And um, I, of course, um, I'm happy for any ideas and feedback. And by this, I want to give over to my Nina now again and um, the Q&As that may be available to you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Alex, for this great presentation, great insights and examples that you gave about the right approach to S4HANA. And I can highly recommend the blog post series that Alex put together on the SAP community. Those are a few, uh, like multiple articles around this topic, if you're interested. Um, I also want to highlight that for this um, SAP community call, we had 130 registrants, which just shows the the interest, the high interest in this topic. So thank you again for this presentation, Alex. Um, before we go to Q&A now, 
um, we have a poll open, still in progress. So for those of you who have not answered the poll yet, we would really love to hear your insights, um, where you're from and um, how you like this presentation. It would be great to hear your feedback. And um, from your side, if you want, you can now ask your questions in the chat or um, in the Q&A. Um, section of your menu in this call. You can also raise your hand. So there should be a little hand on the, on the menu that you could see. And um, I can unmute you if you want. And of course, there will be a follow-up email coming to you and all that have missed this call, but also you as attendees. Um, with the information that Alex just shared about how to contact him and also the recording of this call. Um, yeah, so thank you again for attending and thank you, Alex, for this presentation. I hope to hear more of these in the SAP community calls. Thank you, thank you and have a great day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.